what happened was uh, Kevin Knapp, who I originally contacted, emailed me in the spring and let, and let me know that he couldn't make it. Something came up, but he said, I rest assure you, you don't have to worry about finding anybody else because I've got your, I got my replacement already. So this man was kind enough to fill in for him and, and travel from the D.C. area today. Uh, his name is Dr. Uh, I'm going to, can I use Jim? Yeah. <laughs> James Green. <laughs> he's a he's a NASA chief scientist. He has received his PhD in physics from the University of Iowa. He has worked for NASA for over 35 years, managing and participating in a number of NASA solar system missions. Although his day job involves NASA. He had a long, passionate, personal interest in the history of the Civil War, and particularly ballooning. For more than 25 years, James has conducted research into the Civil War balloons and has spoken at a number of events, including the 150th anniversary of Lowe's first teetered balloon ascension on the Washington, D.C. wall, from which the first aerial telegraph was sent. He served as an advisor in the Intrepid Project, an initiative to construct and fly the world's first replica of a Civil War balloon named uh, Man Balloon at Genesee County Village and Museum in Mumford, New York. He has worked with Civil War Trust by identifying locations of the balloon stations during the Peninsula Campaign. So I would like us here at Hershey Civil War Round Table to give Jim a nice warm welcome. <laughs> so the Balloon Corps, as we uh, commonly have called it, isn't really well known, uh, but I hope to change that uh, over the course of the evening. But as you probably recognize, um, uh, taking the high ground is always one of the most important things you can do because you can gather military intelligence. And this is really all about uh, troop, strength, location, and movement. That's the intelligence you want to be able to, be able to extract. And the balloons were able to do that all over the place. So um, uh, let's get started. The beginning of the Civil War, uh, after Fort Sumner was uh, attacked, and, uh, April 12, 1861, call for war uh, was uh, ringing out throughout all the newspapers. Many of the aeronauts uh, were encouraged, in fact, you can read many of the old Civil War papers of that era where they're talking about the importance of balloons to gather that kind of uh, intelligence. And so aeronauts came out of the woodwork uh, to be able to start working with the Army. And I'm going to talk about uh, a few failed attempts. Uh, one of the first ones uh, was James Allen. He uh, is a, a hardcore balloonist all his life. He actually died in the 1890s from, uh, uh, in a balloon accident uh, in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, and he uh, joined uh, the 1st Regiment, Rhode Island, that Burnside was putting together. And so he went down to Washington, D.C. Uh, they camped at Catton's Farm, which is uh, uh, on the uh, uh, corner of New York and Rhode Island, if you're familiar with the D.C. area. Uh, of course, it doesn't look like that now. And, and, uh, and uh, you can just barely make out the Capitol building in the background. Uh, that, from that location, um, Allen was able to fill his balloon uh, at the local gas works. So, uh, unlike today, when you walk in a room and turn on a light, during that period of time, you would, in these major cities, go into your building, turn on a spigot, which would have illumination gas that's being fed to you, and you lit that. That illumination gas is carbonated hydrogen. It comes from uh, a, a slow burning peat and, and unmatured coal. And that was done in many of these cities. Uh, that gas then was put in large tanks and then, and then uh, shoved through the pipes 
uh, and illumination gas that was readily available. In DC, the place where the illumination gas is located is currently the position of the American Indian Museum, right across the street from the Air and Space Museum. That's where, that's where the illumination gas place was. So uh, Alan would fill his balloon there, uh, and then and then try to work with uh, with Burnside's uh, first row island. But he had all kinds of problems. Um, uh, he would, when they would go into uh, Virginia, he would fill it up at the gas works at Alexandria, and after. Uh, several attempts, uh, he realized uh, uh, he just didn't have the equipment and capability to be able to pull it off. He popped one of these balloons. Uh, uh, that, uh, uh, these, are, these are fragile balloons. Balloons are meant to ride the air and to be light. And they weren't designed to be tethered and held in place, uh, blasted by the wind. And so consequently, he recognized early on that that wasn't going to be working for him. Uh, another one, John the Mountain, uh, also a very famous aeronaut at the time. Uh, and I'm sorry I can't see the map, but uh, Washington, D.C., and, and uh, here's Richmond, and right here's the end of um, uh, the Potomac uh, uh, and Fortress Monroe, uh, down at the bottom of what's called the peninsula, uh, is where uh, uh, Ben Butler was. General Butler actually uh, held, uh, held Fortress Monroe while many other places all around were being captured by the Confederates and taken over. Fortress Monroe was solid in, in Union hands early on in the war. And he uh, actually hired uh, uh, John Lamontin uh, to come down with one of his balloons, uh, which John did. It was uh, uh, the Atlantic. Uh, John had two balloons, the Atlantic and the Saratoga. The Atlantic was the smaller one. And it came down and actually, uh, in the uh, uh, June, July, and August time frame, while Butler was the commanding general at Fortress Monroe, uh, actually did some fabulous observations. Uh, one of the observations, uh, he actually launched it from uh, a, a, a small boat called the Fanny, and from the Fanny he was able to make some sketches. So here, here's our first really great uh, balloon sketch. Uh, this is a tool point. And you see the tents and the gun emplacements were being put in. And this is uh, August 10th, 1861. Uh, and so these, uh, these were important observations because Butler needed to know uh, what kind of um, uh, activity the Confederates were uh, installing guns and pointing at Fortress Monroe and what they, were, what they would encounter in the future. So Lamont did a really great job supporting that until Ben Butler at, uh, actually got uh, uh, changed by um, McClellan, who had come in at that time. Uh, and, and Butler went to, I don't remember exactly where he ended up, but uh, the new commander that came in didn't like balloons, didn't use Lamont, and so Lamont was, uh, was very uh, discouraged and ended up coming up into the Washington, D.C. area. And he'll, he'll come back in our story again. The uh, really famous aeronaut, uh, who, who just started becoming an aeronaut a few years before the war, and he was really coming up in notoriety, is this guy, Thaddeus Lowe. And Thaddeus Lowe knew Joseph Henry. They corresponded a lot. And one of the things Lowe wanted to do, along with several other aeronauts, is actually do a transatlantic flight. And this was going on, this big discussion at aeronautic conferences where the aeronauts would get together and talk about how they could do that because the winds at, at altitude actually uh, blow uh, from west to east. The concept is, well, we could probably cross the Atlantic faster than any boat could and do it in a matter of days uh, and, and bring uh, information and information, uh, rapid information can be quite uh, important uh, financially. So. Uh, with the outbreak of the war, that stopped that whole idea. Uh, and uh, uh, Joseph Henry advised Lowe that if he wanted to participate in the war, he needed to come down to Washington, D.C. and get the attention of Abraham Lincoln. And indeed, this is, uh, this is the uh, uh, activity that uh, Lowe decided to do. He brought one of these balloons, the Enterprise, down. This is what the mall looked like in 1861. Here's what it looks like, of course, today. Here's the gas works. And the canal 
the CNO Canal ran through the mall like this. All right? And so uh, Lowe stayed at uh, one of the local hotels, brought his balloon over, gassed it up, and in this area right here, right in front of the Air and Space Museum, he went up to about 500 feet, tethered, and it tethered, he tethered his balloon. Uh, wasn't uh, wasn't designed uh, th this experiment to be a free flight, so he wanted a tether. And with him, he brought a telegraph operator and the telegraph operator supervisor, who absolutely had to go up with him. And so the telegraph operator, had, using a Brelow telegraph, sat at the bottom of the balloon, and low went up uh, 500 feet. And so that telegraph line then uh, came down. Uh, and was connected into the to the local telegraph uh, lines, and um, we've recreated that event you know, on the 150th anniversary, June 17, 1861. So, uh, so uh, uh, here is the recreation. We did this on the mall. Here's the air, actually the Air and Space Museum. Here is the uh, American Indian Museum, and this is where the gas works were. So right here, uh, we, we recreated the, the activity. Uh, it worked really well, and it, it's uh, commemorated by this particular plaque that we put right on the outside of the building, the Air and Space Museum. You can come into the back way, you can, you, can, you can see it. Now, from the balloon, this is the view you have. Uh, we actually were allowed, and we applied and, and got the approval to uh, have a, a healing field balloon, more of a modern balloon with cameras on it, uh, to go up to altitude, 500 feet, and then take images of that area. So this is really pretty much uh, what we're seeing here, of course, in Virginia, here, of course, in the Potomac. Uh, the White House actually is, is right here, it's sitting in the trees. Uh, they're on the way. But uh, you, 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 can, you can get a feel for, for, for what that was like uh, exactly 150 years ago. Now, from the balloon, low recites a telegram and that telegram is delivered to the President of the United States. So when Henry told Lowe he needed to get the President's attention, this was the obvious thing for him to do. This was the first aerial telegram ever, ever done, okay? Uh, in fact, it was thought at that time you couldn't really do that from altitude for a whole variety of bogus reasons. And, uh, and Lowe, uh, Lowe knew that wasn't the case. Enough. So here's what the telegram said you know, to the president from Balloon Enterprise. This point of observation commands an area nearly 50 miles in diameter. The city with its girl of encampments presents a superb scene. I have the pleasure in sending you this first dispatch ever telegram from an aerial station and in acknowledging indebtedness to the encouragement for the opportunity of demonstrating the availability of the science of aeronautics and the military service of the country. So this indeed got, uh, got Lincoln's attention. Uh, that the, a telegram was delivered. Uh, Lincoln read it, invited Lowe that night to have dinner with him at the White House. And so indeed Lowe uh, took his balloon, went to the, went to the backyard of, um, of the White House had it, uh, had it tethered, tethered down, and then spent a significant amount of, uh, of the evening talking to Lincoln one-on-one -on -one about the advantages from a balloon to obtain military intelligence. Okay, that's troop size, location, and movement. All right? Now, uh, this telegram is really perfect, and a, a perfect example of, of, of uh, what Lowe does. Um, yeah, you, the 50 miles is, uh, is, is too far, really, to be able to observe at 500 feet anything, okay? And so he, he loves to exaggerate. He could barely see into Virginia, so he's not really going to see you know, much in the way of uh, any of the Confederate army. He needs to be up higher. Now, he knows that, but he really is, uh, is really all about selling it. In fact, that's an element of what Lowe did, is he is a superb salesman, in addition to a superb engineer, although he always called himself a scientist, which he wasn't. <laughs> Take my word for it. Now, um, once Lincoln uh, really got to know Lowe and recognize the importance of, of um, military intelligence from, uh, from aloft, Lowe eventually becomes 
we had of what was called at the time the Aeronautics Department, AD. All right? And, and that was under McClellan. McClellan loved the idea. And so anything Lowe wanted, he got. And Lowe wanted to build a fleet of balloons. This is the first balloon he built. It's called the Union, 38 feet wide, 45 feet high, 32,000 cubic feet of gas capacity. Uh, with four cables, you could, you could uh, lift five men and, and cost the government $1,500, all right? Now, Lowe, in, in building these balloons, had a certain approach. The first approach is, that, as you can see, this is beautifully illustrated, okay? Painted so that you could easily see it. And one of the things Lowe wanted to make absolutely sure happen is through intimidation. When he sent a balloon out, he wanted everyone to see it. You know, it wasn't going to be painted gray or bluish gray or try to hide in the clouds or any of that stuff. He wanted everybody to see it because the idea was the Confederates would look at the balloon, I can see the balloon, therefore they can see me. Well, that's a fallacy. It's not going to happen that way. Uh, but, but that was an element of what Lowe did. All right? So Lowe had these beautifully, uh, beautifully painted balloons. He also he built them very special uh, with uh, uh, in, uh, imported silk that was double silk with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, sewn in a particular way um, and coated with a varnish uh, that was airtight. You would fill these balloons with illumination gas. These were not hot air balloons. You'd fill them with carbonated hydrogen. And then Lowe later on also developed the capability of, of filling them with molecular hydrogen. He was really good at chemistry. And so uh, uh, this is the kind of thing he did. He also recognized that uh, as tethered balloons, they'd have to withstand the wind. So he built them strong. He built them large because he wanted them to be able to take up as many uh, officers and others as possible uh, and, and be up for long periods of time. Now, uh, each of these balloons, once filled, could stay aloft for long periods of time and didn't need to be inflated for three or four weeks. Okay? So a Naranot could be in the balloon all day and all night. All right? A tethered balloon, looking, at, and many of them did, and, and looking out over, over particular areas. So, uh, they were very strong specially made and, uh, and had certain lift capacity. So this is his first one, the Union. Now in that class, uh, the next one is the Intrepid. This is the really famous balloon that, that you see if you've seen any of the Brady photographs of uh, Lowell on the Peninsula, uh, that area between New York and, and James River uh, where, where uh, McClellan was uh, going to knock off Richmond. The Intrepid uh, is really uh, in that same union class, four cables, five men. Uh, another, another balloon is uh, the Constitution. All right. Now this is slightly smaller. Uh, of course, that made it a little, made it a little cheaper. Uh, still four cables, three men. The, the, the number of cables were important. You had to have a minimum of three cables. All right. Because if you didn't and you had one cable, the wind would spin the balloon. And so you can't, you don't create a stable platform. With four cables, or three at the least, uh, 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 tied off, or held by a uh, detail of men, uh, you, could, you could be stable and you could observe uh, in particular positions and directions. The United States, also in the class of uh, the previous balloon, uh, the smaller class balloons, uh, the Washington, all right? Two men, this is a two men, uh, two-man uh, um, uh, balloon. These are at different sizes because Lowe wanted to be able to do a couple things. One is get them inflated faster, go up quicker, but but that uh, but that was at the cost of who he could take up. That's a, so this is a two-man balloon. Then he built two smaller balloons, the ones that can inflate in 20 minutes or less. The large balloons took several hours. Okay, and so here is some. Um, 
the Excelsior, and the Eagle. And these are one-man balloons uh, with uh, significantly less uh, less gas. All right. So there's the seven balloons that he had, and he hired a whole series of aeronauts. All right. So Lowell hired uh, Ebenezer, Ebenezer, Ebenezer Seaver, James Allen, John Steiner, <coughs> Joseph Starkweather, and he was handed uh, John Lamountain. Now Lamountain and Lowe did not get along at all. They fought constantly. And so since Lamountain had two of his own balloons, the Saratoga and the Atlantic, Lowe refused, him, refused giving him any balloons and uh, really, really wanted to shun uh, a mountain. And, and so that kind of a rivalry did not help the reputation of the workforce of the mountain. Now Lowell also invented gas generators, okay? So these generators, these wooden generators that fit nicely on uh, uh, wagon, wagon uh, uh, wheels, kind of Stoga-like uh, system, um, he built 12 of those initially but uh, since he lost two, and I'll tell you how that happened, he had two more built, okay? They went with these balloons. So the smaller balloons would require one of the gas generators, and the larger balloons, you would use two gas generators to, to fill a balloon. Now how they worked is um, uh, you would uh, fill inside these boxes uh, that, were, that were designed to be um, uh, well-constructed, uh, tanks, if you will, uh, iron filings, and then from the top, uh, from this top right here, you pour in a dilute solution of sulfuric acid. So that's uh, H2SO4 plus Fe, and that's an exothermic reaction, and you pop off the oxygen and the hydrogen. You disassociate that because the iron gets oxidized, takes that oxygen in the, in, uh, out, of the, out of the water, and uh, you end up then uh, with uh, H2 molecular hydrogen that you then uh, go from, uh, uh, from the tanks, it, it pours out of these tanks uh, because the pressure builds up, goes through these scrubbers where they actually take out impurities, and then goes through another one which actually cools this very hot molecular hydrogen. So, that meant that these portable gas generators, whenever he would take them into the field, is he needed water, and a lot of it. So he would always be near rapidly flowing streams. So as they, as they went out into the field, that's where he'd be looking for, and he'd be looking for a place that was typically depressed, because he wanted to be able to hide the balloon from the Confederates until he was ready to loft it. Uh, and and, and uh, then uh, surprise him as he goes up. So uh, here he is. Uh, this is one of the famous Brady photographs. This is the fourth main uh, low. Every time he'd go uh, and have his aeronauts take some of these balloons to different locations, uh, he would um, not have a crew. He had a few uh, military men assigned to him, but only a handful. Uh, they did a lot of paperwork, etc., and, and, and would work with the army to acquire salary and you know pay pay, pay these guys. These were all contractors, all right. So Lowe and his team uh, were never in the military; they were hired on, okay. And so when he would go, he would need 35 or 30 to 35 men, uh, and they were always detailed to him. And so the fourth main. Uh, was detailed to him, and, and um, uh, there's more than 350 or so men that had been detailed over a long period of time, two, three years in the, in the Bloom Corps, 61, 62, and 63, uh, before it was disbanded, uh, supporting these balloons, and that included the 118th Pennsylvania, okay, so there's 35 men from the 118th Pennsylvania that helped support it low and, uh, and, uh, on the peninsula. This is a rapidly flowing stream. This is the Gaines Mill House right here. Uh, we're down in a valley. And here's Lowe himself. Uh, and here's the man filling that, filling that, uh, that particular balloon, which uh, turns out uh, to be the intrepid. Now, uh, he would use these men on three, three of the ropes. So typically, when he went into battle or needed to come up uh, uh, right away with uh, uh, with the balloon and move it, he would have 10 men on a line. 
and they would train these men on how to deploy the balloon, he would go up and they would move that into position. So from the Gainesville farm, as you can see, they were in this big ravine. Uh, they would inflate the balloon, the men would get to their lines, and they would walk up the hill, and so he'd have the advantage of a hill, and then he would go up a thousand feet. All right? So he knew he needed to get up at altitude. Now at a thousand feet, you can see 15 miles. Okay? That is what it takes an army to move in a day. Now one of the things Lincoln really liked about that whole concept is of course uh, Maryland uh, fortunately stayed in the Union, but there was a lot of Confederate sympathies. Virginia, a lot of talk in the paper that they could just cross the Potomac and knock off Washington, D.C. And so Lincoln wanted the ability to have intelligence coming in that monitored the armies on the other side of the Potomac and kept Washington, D.C. safe. And Lowe provided that. Uh, did that actually very well. So that's how Lowe worked. Uh, many of these cases, but not all, he would take a telegraph system with him. And that telegraph system would be connected into, uh, you know, whether it's McClellan or other, other groups. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Uh, when um, Lowe's base was in um, uh, Philadelphia, all right? His base was in Philadelphia, was where he was uh, uh, stationed. And he had his seamstress there making the balloons. And so uh, on the train ride from uh, Washington, D.C. up to Philadelphia, uh, he made this sketch. Okay, this is an original low sketch, and the idea is, wow, I need, I need a conveyance uh, that, that can be towed, and this would give me the opportunity then for a mobile platform that extends well beyond what these 30 men can take them and be able to do, uh, uh, get into places uh, with the balloon that, that you, you couldn't do um, on land. And so this, uh, this sketch he took back to McClellan, uh, told McClellan this is what he absolutely had to have. Well, McClellan approved it, went over to the Navy Yard and picked out a vessel. Now the vessel he ended up picking out was the George Washington Park Custis. Now the George Washington Park Custis, okay, if you, if, if you uh, remember Arlington was in the Lee family, that was a Custis property. Lee's wife was a Custis, and George Washington Park Custis uh, owned that mansion, and in the 1840s and early 1850s, he had a scooter built to take material to market and also bring people uh, across the Potomac uh, to his property when he had a variety of events, which he'd do uh, fairly often. So the GW Park Custis was built in Washington, D.C. for that purpose for uh, the Custis family. And so this boat uh, was sold uh, just uh, prior to the Civil War, and the Army picked it up, eventually picked it up, kept the name, tore off the superstructure because it was a great, had a great uh, uh, hull, and they wanted to use it as a coal barge. Okay? So here you are in the Navy Yard, which is in the Atacoskia River. And all the big boats, uh, you know, the, the, the several masted uh, uh, boats would uh, come up. Uh, the Potomac couldn't get into the Anacostia, so they would take these coal barges and take the coal out to the boats. And that's what they had planned to use this vessel for. Well, saw it after they had stripped off the superstructure and said, great, I want it, plank it. And he made the first aircraft carrier out of it. <laughs> now, um, I have to tell you my impression, knowing Lowe as intimately as I have, reading his stuff and what he's done and what he claims to have done over the years, he probably got that idea from John Lamountain, all right? Because Lamountain actually did it uh, uh, from another vessel. And to, it, like Lowe, he just wanted to one-up it, you know, we'll make it a, you know, make it a flat top boat where he could actually put his gas generators on it, okay, and fill the balloons and then launch them and then have them towed. So, uh, so indeed, uh, that works slick and this, this, uh, this boat did a really wonderful service. So, uh, the beginning of the war, uh, Lowe kept Washington safe, all right? 
he deployed balloons from Edwards Ferry, uh, Fairfax Courthouse, Clouds Mill, Poet Church, on down to Bud's Ferry. So that line was designed to observe Confederates over in Virginia to provide an alert if, if Washington, D.C. was going to be invaded. Okay? So uh, he had uh, stationed many of his aeronauts, as you can see here, all the aeronauts that were stationed. Uh, and uh, so let's go through uh, several of these uh, locations. One, Edwards Ferry. Now, uh, so Edwards Ferry, once again, that's uh, way up here, way high. Why is it so high up? Well, it turns out what was happening in Washington, D.C., to get intelli intelligence information, uh, which uh, uh, many, many people living in Washington, D.C. were very sympathetic to the Confederacy and would, would know generals or, you know, be at variety of meetings and, and women would be interacting with the generals, etc. And they would gather intelligence on, on troop strength and what, what uh, uh, states they were from, all that kind of information. That had to flow. And it turns out one of the best ways to do it was go up here and cross into Virginia at Edwards Ferry. This was a place where uh, information was leaking uh, into Virginia big time. And so uh, McClellan had uh, Stone hit the core up and stop that intelligence. And then uh, Stone decided uh, uh, to test the Confederacy in October and went across. Uh, and then the Battle of Balls Bluff was an absolute disaster. Right after that, McClellan said, you're getting a balloon. And so, uh, so he sent a balloon up. Here's Edwards Ferry, okay? This is actually a, a period sketch, and uh, that balloon with an eagle on it gives it, gives it away. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, the, uh, one, of, one of those um, uh, famous balloons. Uh, and, and, and this fort, Fort Evans, the really big fort, which is right here, uh, was where a lot of the Confederates stayed. This is, uh, this is their big fort. And so uh, Edwards Ferry then was this, was this particular location for which we recreated, uh, once again from altitude, using our helium balloon and cameras, the look and feel of what you can see from that. And that actually is the Fort Evans right there, okay? And so, indeed, you can, you can monitor the, the Potomac and look into, uh, look into Virginia. Now, we were only allowed, uh, based on uh, uh, our um, uh, application and what, what uh, we could do, because Dallas was not, not too far uh, down, uh, down, uh, downstream here, to go only up to about uh, 800 feet. But 1,000 feet would be a little bit better view and a better advantage. So, uh, another location was Clouds Mill. Now, because that is uh, out in Virginia, uh, well, well away from Washington, D.C., uh, Lowe would have, have his men fill off their balloons uh, at the Alexandria Gas Works, which is, uh, which is right here, tow it through town and then go out to Clouds Mill and observe. And then down in Bud's Ferry, so here's the Potomac, what was happening is the Confederates were building gun emplacements up and down the Potomac. You can see it at the uh, uh, shipping point right there, cockpit point, and uh, freestone point really had quite, quite an array of guns. And that was designed to blockade the Potomac. Okay? Now, if you were in Washington, D.C., you received your supplies two ways. Through the railroad going through Baltimore, okay, also very southern, uh, sympathetic uh, region, or up, up the Potomac. And so the Confederates started immediately blocking uh, commerce up and down the Potomac. And they did that at these locations. And so Lowe had, one of, uh, uh, had an opportunity uh, to join Hooker's group. Uh, Hooker came down here uh, to uh, Bud's Ferry. So here's the ferry, here's the Posey House. This is, uh, this is the area that Lowe would, uh, would be stationed in, and, and this particular creek is where they would be using the rapidly running water to be able to use their gas uh, uh, generators in the field. And uh, uh, one of uh, uh, the important sketches, another one of, of, of enormous military 
importance was done by William Small, the 26th Pennsylvania Infantry. He's a great artist. And he had an opportunity to go up in one of Lowe's balloons. And then uh, you can see there's cockpit point, uh, there's shipping point. And, uh, and from that, you could sketch. And you, can't, you may not be able to see it, but there's numbers here. There's each of these numbers that also had a legend. All right? And so uh, uh, when, uh, when the balloons would go up, then they would say, uh, Area 5 has got more troops or less. There's fewer tents. There's all sorts of changes that are occurring. And so that kind of military intelligence was flowing into Hooker early on, and, uh, and Hooker took uh, benefit from that. What was happening is, as these uh, balloons were making observations, is uh, Lincoln was pushing McClellan uh, into a major campaign of going down the Potomac and, and trying to knock off Richmond, all right? And so McClellan was dragging his feet for several months but the reports coming back from the balloons uh, were that, in particular, uh, this area, Poet Church, was the first area. This was one of Lowe's balloons. Here's where he tested the smaller ones. The Eagle, for instance, this, is, uh, this actually is the Eagle. Uh, uh, they began to see the withdrawal. So the withdrawal of men going uh, uh, down towards Richmond uh, uh, was uh, uh, given that information to McClellan, and so McClellan said, okay, we're, let's go down to the Tony and uh, get this campaign started. And this, of course, is the Peninsula campaign, and uh, one of the first things he wanted to do is send a balloon down there before he sent men. And so Lowe sent one of these, uh, one of these aeronauts, Seaver to get down to Fortress Monroe, which is right here. Now, this is an area where the Butler had issued, as I mentioned earlier. This was uh, uh, firmly held by the Union the whole course of the war. Here's the York River, and here's the James River, and up here is Richmond. Okay, that's what makes this the peninsula, of course. And so what, uh, what uh, he was supposed to do, Seaver was supposed to do, is get his balloon up and look for the monitor, all right? Everyone was very upset about uh, the monitor. Uh, in fact, there was quite a bit of talk about the monitor going up the Potomac and shelling Washington, D.C., okay? So that never happened, obviously. But uh, uh, by having a balloon down here, giving the all okay, uh, then, uh, then uh, McClellan was able to bring his men down and, and land here in uh, uh, Hampton. Uh, and, and then embark and, and begin to go up these roads. Now, one of the other key things that the balloons did is uh, they were connected to the topographical engineers, and those are the guys uh, that made maps, all right? So uh, you have to remember, when the war started, uh, there weren't too many Virginians, native Virginians in the Union Army anywhere, and so they were clueless as to where these roads were going, uh, how good these roads are, and, and uh, they really needed the balloon observations to help map out these roads, okay? So an enormous number of Bernard is a, one of the famous uh, sketches. You can look in the big atlas and see many of these sketches. A lot of that information was culled out from the, from the, from the balloon core. And observations. He went up all the time while, while we're taking off. Of course, um, as they uh, came up the peninsula, uh, what happened is uh, Magruder here in Yorktown uh, actually built the fences across across uh, the peninsula right here and stopped the army. So as um, as the men began to move up, uh, Lowe ended up with Heisman's Corps right here. And uh, they would uh, launch a balloon from this uh, from this location. Uh, the balloon boat, uh, which carried a lot of the iron filings and, and all their other balloons and other equipment, uh, came right up here in a Warmsley Creek right here, so that it was easy for them to go to. And then there's a, a, a stream that dumps right in the Warmsley Creek, and that's that's where they would fill their balloons. And then Lowe would come up to this road. Uh, right where the sawmill is uh, to look uh, to look into uh, Yorktown. So uh, this this was a stalemate for for quite a while, uh, good, a good month. 
Uh, they, they started up in, in uh, March and, and way into April and, and, and uh, it really took them uh, a whole month. The uh, uh, first week of May, they started leaving Yorktown and going back. Now what was happening is McClellan was bringing up his big artillery and created a siege, um, a one-sided siege for Yorktown. Uh, Yorktown was still getting supplies. And in fact, um, uh, uh, McClellan wanted to know what was happening on the James side. So here's Lowe's balloon on the York, uh, the, uh, Yorktown on the York River side. And so Lowe was asked to uh, put up a balloon at Warwick Courthouse and had Allen, uh, who he just hired at that time, come in and manage the balloon here because here is the, uh, here's the James River, okay? Now at, at this particular location, uh, on Keyes' staff was uh, a young officer by the name of George Armstrong Custer. And he was asked <coughs> on a number of occasions to go up with Allen and observe. And so uh, it's uh, well known, uh, actually Custer wrote about this, so I'm just going to paraphrase what happened. Uh, it's amazing he actually wrote this, but uh, uh, on his first journey up in, in one of Lowe's balloons with James Allen, uh, Custer began, uh, very, became, became very fearful, and he actually cowered down at the bottom of the basket. He wouldn't come up, okay? So this is the fearless Custer, right? He's afraid of these altitudes. Allen is, st is standing there in the balloon, of course, a, 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 a decades old aeronaut, saying, you know, come on, it's, you're looking, you're missing this fabulous view, get out up here, you know, as they're towing the balloon, and it's only going higher. And he's getting more and more scared. And, uh, and Alan asked him, well, what's your problem? And he said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid the basket will, will, will break and will fall. And so Alan starts jumping up and down <laughs> to demonstrate that it's not going to break. Okay? And so um, I'm sure that didn't help the situation. <laughs> but I have to admit, Custer was able to overcome his fear and this is one of the first examples of doing exactly that. He did get up, and then he started to enjoy the ride, and then he got it. And he went up quite often. And he would, uh, on his own, he didn't need help, okay? And so uh, uh, that, that's uh, one of those little interesting tidbits uh, uh, that uh, helped shape uh, his life from there on. And see many examples where he overcame his fear and did things that were pretty crazy. On May 4th, Custer was up early in the morning, like 4 or 5 in the morning, and saw Yorktown being evacuated. He came down, sent a telegram to McClellan, who then sent a, sent a courier over to Heiselman to verify that the Confederates were leaving Yorktown, falling back on the Williamsburg Road. And indeed, <coughs> Lowe went up, I think even Heiselman went with him on this one, uh, and observed just that and confirmed that. And, and then that started the process of then McClellan taking Yorktown. And, and uh, here's, uh, here's Yorktown. So this actually is a period sketch out of one of the, uh, one of the major magazines. Uh, I will mention as an aside, Lowe loved the reporters. The reporters would come and he would, he would feed their horses and, 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 and provide a vetting so they could stay with the balloon corps and then take them up in the balloons. And he did that for marketing reasons, okay? He wanted them to report on what they saw in the balloons showing their value. But here was the problem with that, all right? As he would go up, particularly at night, one of the best things the Balloon Corps did, and they did it a lot at, at night uh, in the Yorktown area, is count campfires, okay? So you know how many Confederates you can get around a campfire? About 10, okay? So he could count the campfires and he could see this road is where they're at. No campfires along this road, all right? And the reporters would report that in the paper. 
uh, four or five days later, General Lee would be reading that in, in a captured uh, uh, article from the New York Times, you know, or the New York Herald, which was another, another one of those, or the Philadelphia Inquirer. He had all those, all I love the Philadelphia um, uh, reporters, of course. They were all down there with him, you know, being a Pennsylvanian. And so consequently, he would have his men go over and build campfires on roads that they weren't on. Okay? So um, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the best things they were doing really got important. Uh, once McClellan took over Yorktown, they then ran up the river. You know, they ran up the, the uh, York River. Uh, they landed in, um, uh, in at the, the, what's called the Confederate White House. Uh, right here at, at, the, uh, uh, at the bend of the York River, and Law was bringing his equipment off, uh, on the land. And then from there, he moves it first over to the Gaines Mill Farm. By that time, uh, Richmond had quite the ring of, um, of embankments and, and uh, uh, redoubts, and, and uh, the men were pouring into Richmond you know, to keep it safe. He then set up another balloon uh, at Mechanicsville, uh, so that they could they could get some really good views, and here's actually another period sketch in a newspaper done by our done by uh, uh, you know, the reporters, and uh, uh, he's looking into Richmond, and he was bragging that he could see the people going to church, right? You know, so talk about talk about the fear uh, that that was going through uh, the Richmond population. Uh, based on the fact that these guys were uh, in these balloons uh, looking down on them. Uh, uh, what happened then is a whole series of battles, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, heralded by, starting with uh, the Battle of Fair Oaks. Uh, we had two balloons up during that time, Gainesville balloon and the Mechanicsville balloon. Uh, and uh, also there was a telegraph operator in Parker Springs uh, was in the gondola with him. Uh, during this particular battle. Now, um, what we do know is that telegraph link went down into McClellan's headquarters. So McClellan was getting real-time information about the movement of the Confederate armies and how Lee was positioning them. Now, during these fights, of course, there's so much smoke, you can't really see through that at, right at the front lines, but you can look around to see the flanking maneuvers and the other things that were happening. And McClellan was getting that material real time. Now, a New York Times reporter reported that that was also connected to the Washington, D.C. line. And so that meant Lincoln and Stanton were in the telegraph room listening to real time balloon reports 120 miles away. Real time, you know? So um, uh, that was going on during this particular battle. Now, uh, uh, McClellan uh, wanted to cross the Chickahominy, uh, which, was, uh, which is right here. And so you can actually wade across it during most times. Okay? And so he, uh, he moved his, uh, his, uh, his operations to the Trent House. So, of course, he wanted a balloon with him at all times. Now, McClellan loved to get intelligence from various sources and then synthesize it himself. That was what he liked to do. So that kind of information was incredibly important to him. And then he would make decisions on what he wanted to do. So what happens next is um, here's a view of, of uh, Lowell, as, uh, as we talked about earlier, right here in this ravine where the Gaines Mill House is, OK? And so what was happening is once the Chickahominy, after a huge rain, overflowed its banks, cut McClellan's army in half, Lee crossed over and took Mechanicsville and then moved down to the Gaines Mill area. Now, Allen, unfortunately, was able to get the balloon and all the equipment out of Mechanicsville at the time. And here uh, is a, a, a chart from uh, the Civil War Trust. Uh, right here is Poet Creek. And this is the valley below us in. This is his balloon station right here. And it was overrun, okay? Uh, Wilcox's Alabamians 
uh, took that, walked right by the gas generators. And ser several, several of the reports coming from these men talk about there's balloon, there's a Lowe's uh, gas station. Uh, they were taken back. Two of these uh, uh, gas generators were taken back. Lowe couldn't get them out in time. Got his balloon and gondolas out, but couldn't get the gas generators out. And they were put on display in the uh, courtyard, the major, the major um, um, main square in Richmond, would be put on uh, put on display for everyone to walk by and see that uh, the Blue Corps wasn't uh, as good as uh, everyone thought, thought it was. This particular area uh, is being bought, has now been bought by the Civil War Trust and turned over to the Park Service. And several of us went down there and identified that area. And you can go on to the Civil War Trust site. This is a little overview. This is Tom Crouch, uh, the head, one of the, at the time was uh, the, the top uh, uh, running the, Air, uh, the Aeronautics Department at the Air and Space Museum. He's written fabulous books on Amelia Earhart and Wright Brothers, by the way. Um, and this is Mike Bowley, uh, who was involved in the uh, uh, Virginia uh, museum that's down there. This is Bowie Creek. This is a creek low used to, to uh, get these gas chambers. We've identified the location. The exact location. Uh, here's McClellan at the Trent House. And of course, as um, uh, things were changing, he had to make some decisions about what he was going to do. And several other battles occurred. Uh, but I want to uh, take an aside and talk about uh, what the Confederates were doing at the time. Because the Union Army had balloons, and a lot of them, the Confederate Army had to respond in some way. And so Lee, uh, several months uh, into the campaign, in June, asked uh, 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 Lang and Shives to develop this balloon, uh, and he did. It was built in Savannah, Georgia, uh, and this balloon was made up of uh, silk that would have made dresses, okay? But this bol these bolts of silk were, were sewn together, very colorful, very colorful, uh, and uh, this balloon was christened the gazelle. But as soon as it started flying, although you can't see it, this is Porter Alexander. He was uh, on Lee's staff. Porter was asked to actually fly the gazelle. And as soon as it went up, and it was so patterned, you know, with uh, silk dresses on it, it was called the silk dress balloon, primarily by the Union Army. Right away, the Union Army was calling it the silk dress balloon. So that was becoming well known. The Confederates called it the Lady Davis, all right? So the gazelle never really made it anywhere, but um, uh, in one of the battles in the peninsula, three balloons were up. Uh, uh, and, and how that was done is the gas works in Virginia, uh, in Richmond, Virginia, right here, here's the railroad station, here's the, the railroads, and so they would uh, have a flat car, they put the, the gazelle on it, they'd fill it, uh, and then they'd run it down the peninsula, and then from that flat car, they'd go up and observe. Now, um, this particular balloon uh, went three or 400 feet, where Lowe's balloon were up at, uh, at 1,000 feet. Uh, once uh, uh, that, those set of observations were made, uh, Lee wanted uh, a report from Porter Alexander. So uh, they brought that back to Richmond, uh, and um, Porter Alexander was allowed to deflate the balloon. Now, this is uh, not accurate. That balloon never flew from the teaser here. But the teaser carried all the balloon equipment with it and went down the James River. But what happened was it ran aground at low tide, and uh, before high tide really picked it up so that they could leave, two Union vessels, the Maritanza and the Monitor, came around the corner, saw it, fired on the vessel, and all the men left, and that included uh, Porter Alexander. And so they, the Union Army took over the teaser. So here, this is a uh, period pictures of the teaser. Actually, the teaser was damaged, was hit by one of the shells from the Maritanza. And, um, uh, Lowe got the silk dress balloon. Now, uh, the Union Army thought, oh, hey, this is great. You can use this balloon, too. And Lowe loved the balloon because he cut it up in little pieces and gave it out as, um, uh, as uh, you know, uh, uh, an advertisement 
that his balloons were better than the Confederate balloons. In fact, he, he gave it to every senator and senator's wives and, and you know, uh, that he could get his hands on. They were down running around in the pits. So Lowe, once again, as a showman, did a lot of that. Well, eventually, after uh, many battles, uh, the column was pushed back and he moved to a particular uh, place right here on the James, his Berkeley Plantation, a place called Harrison's Landing. And uh, uh, this is where uh, he stayed put for uh, several days, more than a week actually. Lincoln was really mad at him. Lincoln said, either take Richmond or come home. So what is he going to do? He's going to come home. All right? And so how is he going to do that? Well, he has a lot of wounded. He has a lot of things he wants to do. He employs the balloons. And here's James Allen in one of the balloons. This is Washington, actually. Uh, uh, the G GW Park Custis is being towed down the James River looking for the Confederates. In fact, the Confederates had several big forts, one of which was Fort Powhatan. Fort Powhatan uh, wasn't manned at the time. That, uh, that, uh, and so the, so the uh, Allen gave the all clear that uh, you could start taking Union boats un, unimpeded down the James and back. And so that's indeed what, what, uh, what uh, McClellan did. He would always been uh, uh, out the James that were wounded and many others and then marched the rest of them over to Yorktown and then they were picked up at Yorktown and then, and then brought back. Uh, pretty much a, a failed campaign from their perspective. Now the Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville campaigns are also quite fascinating. But what was fascinating about the Fredericksburg campaign is uh, the Union Army now is stationed in and around Fredericksburg, Virginia, after uh, McClellan was gotten rid of and Burnside was put in charge. And here they are trying to figure out what to do. And the balloon station is right down here in this gully where the stream flows by. In fact, if you go, um, if you go across uh, the river, um, uh, this is a uh, 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 on the other side of Fredericksburg. Uh, the balloon station is marked with a plaque, so we, we know exactly where they were. Uh, here's the Phillips house that already been that already had uh, been burned down, and this is where Lowe uh, filled these balloons. But McClellan, oh, sorry, Burnside uh, didn't really want that intelligence, so he had one of his aides go up. Um, and look at the battle. Uh, and so in Balloon, Washington, you had um, Teal in a balloon looking at what was happening. And charge after charge after charge on the Maurice Heights, where thousands of Union men were slaughtered in this field, and and pretty much said nothing to uh, to Burnside about it. So a real failed attempt to do use the balloons for any sort of important intelligence. So. Um, uh, Burnside was then changed, and Hooker came in. Now, many of the balloonists were, were really mad at Lowe. They were mad at Lowe because Lowe would get money to pay them, but what he would do is use that money, this was the accusation, to buy feed and grain to feed the horses of the reporters. So the, the aeronauts were getting starved out, okay, and so an IG investigation came in and tried to investigate everything that was going on with Lowe and whether there was malfeasance going on. This is just as Hooker came in. And Hooker then uh, gave uh, his chief engineer, uh, Cyrus Comstock, the job of running the balloon corps. And so he came in, saw that Lowe had hired his father, and he didn't like that, so he had his father fired. Clovis Lowe left. You know, that, uh, uh, that nepotism, you know, wasn't going well with a, with a career, career soldier. And then cut everybody's pay, and Lowe was so mad, Lowe refused to be paid. Now, Lowe was getting $10 a day, day after day. That's a colonel's wage, right? He negotiated that early on, so he was, he was doing okay. And, and his aeronauts were getting five and, five and six dollars uh, a day. And so, uh, consequently, the, the, these two really went at it. But, uh, of course, Comstock uh, really is going to win out. And Lowe said, okay, at the end of the Chancellorsville campaign, and I will work for free, I am leaving the Balloon Corps. 
Okay, even, you know, I'm just so disgusted working in this environment. Now, what was happening is what Hooker did was put together what was called an organization, this organization was called the BMI, okay? Uh, this is the Bureau of Military Information. And this was the organization where all intelligence flowed into. This is the start of the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. This is what it goes back to. And so they were getting interviews from slaves escaping, interviews from deserters. Uh, they were getting uh, reports from the, tele, tele, the signal operators and the telegraph operators who were out in the field that could actually interpret flag information and bringing that back in. And then, of course, the balloon observations all were flowing into a central location and they were analyzing it. They were weighing the, uh, you know, the certain set of intelligence they were bringing in, uh, emphasizing some over others based on its credibility, and then providing Hooker accurate information. And they told Hooker that Lee was set pat in this particular area and uh, left several things in garden. One uh, was this fort up here. Uh, and its name escapes me at the moment. Kelly's Ford, I think, is what it is. Uh, but uh, Hooker devised a plan then of uh, leading a uh, small force, pinning down some of Lee's army right here in Fredericksburg, and moving around and crossing through this ford that was uh, not being guarded, and then surrounding Lee, okay, who was uh, largely stationed here. And then he had Stoneman ride completely around this area uh, so that the concept was we're going to cut off Lee's retreat from this position to Richmond, which is straight south here. The plan was probably one of the best strategic uh, plans, military plans, that was ever done in the war based on accurate uh, interpretation of the intelligence. Uh, but Hooker couldn't pull it off. He brought his men over uh, into this particular area while keeping Early's men here uh, with Sedgwick then uh, uh, held, to, held to, uh, to this particular area. Lowe was in this particular balloon and his reports were uh, very interesting and that was uh, uh, he had a telegraph operator and he was sending telegraph messages looking for changes uh, that we would either go in any direction that was a critical intelligence. But what Hooker didn't think about is that he actually extended his force so far he couldn't get the telegraph lines all the way over. So a lot of the intelligence that were being collected by the Balloon Corps, uh, both here at um, uh, Falmouth and also uh, at um, uh, uh, across from Fredericksburg and Bain's Corps, which is right here, uh, wasn't, getting to, wasn't getting to Hooker. Now it turns out one of the things Lee also liked to do is he would he would make changes when the weather was bad because the balloons couldn't go up. Whether it was too windy or it was raining or whatever, a lot of movements were made. And during the early part of the day, he had um, uh, he had of course um, uh, Stonewall Jackson move around and then come come at come at Hooker from this direction. Probably not observed by the balloons because, definitely not observed by the balloons because they were not up. It was too windy. It was too windy. So Lee, whatever intelligence he gathered, uh, was a master at being able to interpret it and then act appropriately. Well, at the end of the Chancellorsville campaign, uh, which uh, uh, was a resounding victory for uh, the Confederate Army, and they went back to Washington in disgrace. The last activity the Balloon Corps did was in the rear. So Lowe left, and Allen was in charge of the, balloon, the balloons and managing it, and Cyrus Comstock was sent to Grant uh, on, the, in the, um, uh, on the western uh, front. And uh, Allen then was making observations of, of, of uh, the Confederates as they were retreating back to Washington, D.C. Now what happened was uh, Hooker ordered that the Quartermaster General pick up the equipment and take it to Washington. It didn't necessarily specify where. And the Quartermaster Department put it in a warehouse uh, on New York Avenue. 
All right? And so it's all black <coughs> stuff, all the balloons, all, all the uh, gas generators, and then stored in this warehouse. Now, of course, this is my conception of what that might look like. This is uh, from the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. And so it stayed there. Hooker left, uh, me came in, Grant came in. Now Grant had uh, virtually no information about the use of balloons. Me had some, because he was part of the, of the Fredericksburg campaign, where the balloons were absolutely ineffective, because they weren't used uh, appropriately. And so the Balloon Corps was never called out of Washington, D.C. And after a year being in the warehouse, it was decided by a clerk with approval by a supervisor, we better sell all this stuff. And so in April 1864, a little less than a year after they were stored, uh, in this warehouse, all the balloons, seven balloons, all the fixtures, everything was sold on auction. Now Lowe ends up with the balloon Washington. He comes down from Philadelphia and gets the balloon Washington. And Washington actually ends up fighting in another war in South America and doing a great job there, uh, where they actually use the intelligence of everywhere. But that ends the balloon corps. It was an exciting time. It gathered appropriate intelligence. The problem was it was such a new technology, it was not put in the context it needed to. And when it was, in particular by Hooker, Hooker didn't last long enough to be able to make a go of it. And all the B, although the BMI was kept by Grant, uh, and, and the balloons could have been used tremendously effectively at Petersburg, where everyone was in trenches. You go up, you could see everything that Lee was doing in terms of moving men uh, to places where then it was thin and, 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 and well fortified, and, and where you would where you would attack. You would not have had nine months in the trenches at Petersburg if the balloon corps was up and running at the time. But it was too late; they were already sold. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, there's Kevin right here. Okay, so uh, so we're in the balloon corps. Uh, Kevin uh, portrays uh, Thaddeus Lowe, and I portray James Allen, the real aeronaut of the group. Uh, can I take some questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Did the Confederates ever make any serious effort to shoot them down? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So in the war, there was at least 3,000 flights, OK? And they were shot at constantly, constantly. They were probably the most shot at people. There's plenty of, plenty of stories of, of actual um, uh, cannonballs going between the basket and the balloon, okay? <laughs> and, they were, and they were full of holes, okay? And so uh, Lowe, when he would get a detail of men, would want sail makers, okay? This is why he likes some of the Maine and the Massachusetts group, because typically you would pull out 30 men, and some of them were involved in shipping, and they were sail makers, because when the balloons came down, they needed to be repaired. And so the 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 the, the corps would the corps would do that. Uh, there's only one accident, and that accident happened at Chancellorsville. Um, Hooker really wanted the balloons up. Something was going on. He absolutely demanded that the balloon corps go up and make an observation. This is after Chancellorsville. Uh, he was trying to decide what he was going to do next, and of course uh, Lincoln was just getting mad about it. We'll eventually get rid of him. So he ordered the Allen brothers, uh, uh, James and Ezra Allen, were part of the Bloom Corps, to go on up. Ezra Allen takes the Washington up, but after they pulled out a thousand foot uh, line, they were only up about 300 feet. The wind was enormous. Okay. And, and Alan told him that, and the Allen brothers told him this is just not the, the weather we should be in. It split a seam, the whole seam, and the, and the, the whole gas bag uh, evacuated, and was rocketing down 300 feet. Now, who was on the lines were, was the uh, Fourth Maine. And they'd been with Lowe uh, for many, many months, and they ran up wind. And so instead of the gondola going straight down, it actually came down at an angle, 
and hit, and uh, Ezra Allen survived that. But that was the only accident out of all the flights they did. Yes? Well, talk to me how many balloons were put in the service, like Union, how many Confederates balloons were put in? So, um, uh, Lowe had seven, the Mountain had two, okay? Uh, Wise had one, but it, but it never worked well. Allen had two with him. They had problems, okay? The Confederates uh, had a, a hot air balloon, okay, that they actually used in and around Yorktown with, with no success at all. The silk dress balloon was used quite effectively in, uh, by uh, uh, Porter Alexander, and there was at least two the Confederates had down in Savannah. There's plenty of reports that indicated the Confederates would go to look around and worry. see what was happening, and they used two balloons down in Savannah. Lee had another balloon made and kept it in storage so we could call it out if he needed to. And once the balloon core was, uh, was taken apart, he decided never to call it out because if he did, then he was afraid the Union Army would also do it. And they had far more resources. But he had one in storage. And that was called the Nimbus. It was built by uh, cheaters. Awesome. Yes. Uh, I will come back to you. I, I yes. Yes. To you. Yes, young man. Uh, I forgot. All right. Okay. Uh, if anyone can remember one, yes. Uh, let's see. I can't. No. Uh, two quick questions. Number one: Were balloon balloons used, let's say, in earlier war, like the Crimea, or was the Civil War first? And second, the intelligence is only as good as the quality of the observers, you know, riding the balloon. Was there any kind of special training, or you know, yeah. you know, to help these people, you know, these these right. people Here, give accurate uh, information? Sure, yeah, great question. So uh, uh, yes, the Crimean had it. Okay, and yes, uh, uh, the uh, Mexican War. Were at, they were actually moving ahead with a balloon. Wise was a, was the head of that. Oh wow. Who was, an, who was also an aeronaut, a Pennsylvanian from Lancaster, actually, yeah. uh, who ended up. Uh, going into one of the cavalry units. Um, relative to how good were the, were the aeronauts, the aeronauts would go up with trained officers all the time. And Lowe was up in the balloon early on with Fitz John Porter. And Fitz talked to him for hours, like eight hours at a stretch. What are they going to talk about? Lowe's going to talk about how you manage the balloon. Porter's going to talk about what we're trying to look for. These, the aeronauts were actually well trained, okay? However, because they were not military, but civilians, their stories, quote unquote, were, were not always believed, okay? So there was always a, a, a discount while they came from an aeronaut. You know, who, who's an aeronaut? They're not, you know, they don't know anything about military. No, that's that was, that's a completely bogus argument. Yeah. <laughs> they know an enormous amount about about it. Now, how do I know this is the case? Because Fitz John Porter ends up in a balloon that escaped, and he had to. He was looking at Yorktown uh, in a free flight, and he knew enough about the balloons not to be worried. He actually sketched Yorktown, got the sketches he wanted which were, were well, McClellan wanted to know what guns were, were pointed under the York River because he wanted Goldboro to blow by that if the guns weren't in place. And so Fitz John Porter made those observations, okay? Uh, and as it was at altitude, then lowered it, caught a wind back, and then climbed out of the balloon and pulled the ripcord and deflated the balloon and landed it. He's a military guy. <laughs> This was exactly what an aeronaut would do. So the, the opportunity for these aeronauts to learn the, the trade was, was, was there, Clear, and they clearly did. Their problem is they weren't tasked enough. All right? What do I mean by that? You go, you've been in a balloon, because we just talked about it. The whole area is there. What are you looking for? All right? So from a military perspective, it might be activity on a particular area, a particular road. That's where you want to concentrate your attention. But you need to be taxed. You know, if you go up and you come back down and they say, well, what did you see? 
oh my God, it's on this and that and this and that and this and that and this and that. Well, what moved? Well, we didn't have opportunity to do that. I'm going to look over here. You know, they had to task it, okay? That's exactly what the military does now. You know, with their, with their space assets, they're tasked. The time is we need to observe these areas. Observe them, okay? So the technology was great. This came at a wonderful time. But not the, but the military infrastructure did not know how to use it. Only a few of these guys in the military really did, but they got swept out early on. Yes, sir. Optics. Did they use a standard optics when they were up? Yeah. So Lowe had these fabulous glasses, fabulous, you know, uh, binocular glasses. And uh, um, uh, when the aeronauts uh, set up a place, the first thing, one of the first things they asked for is is bring up the binoculars, and uh, there's several reports where they, they did that. Any power? Any, did they make? I don't remember what, the, okay. what that was. Yes, ma'am? Were the balloons always tethered? I, yeah. Everything I saw had lines yeah. coming up. Yeah, so not I, always. I would imagine the control Yeah, not would be always, better. but 99% of the time. La Mountain loved free flights. He loved to go out, fly all over the place, come back, report a few things, and, and, then, and then spend three or four or five days getting his balloon filled and goofing around. Whereas Lowe knew that they needed constant observations and they needed to be portable. They needed to go to a place to make an observation, which is why the flat top carrier gave them great flexibility. The concept of having men on the line, moving to where you needed to go. You could go right up to the front, see what you needed to, and then fall back. So you had enormous flexibility. So the tethered balloons was the way to go. Well, Mom didn't do it because his balloons, he, he would do a tether occasion there, but his balloons were not built to be tethered. And that's part of the problem. Lowe built them to be tethered. Yes, young man, you got, you got your question. Okay, yes. Was Abraham Lincoln ever on board with the idea of balloons? And if not, did he ever sort of stop the idea, stop the balloon? No, Lincoln went out of his way to create the balloon force. Okay. So he introduced uh, Lowe to Scott, who was the commanding general before McClellan, and insisted that, that, that he do something. Okay, he wasn't directing General Scott to create a balloon corps, but, but that's what he wanted. Uh, he loved the concept of, of that defense in and around Washington, and he was really okay with the idea of Lowe taking up newspapermen, because then all the reports that were coming out in the in the Washington Star and all the other uh, all the other Washington newspapers about gloom and doom and the Confederates are just ready to come over were, were dismissed because the reporters were writing what they saw in the line. One more question you got here. Okay, you pick it. Hey, right you, is there any information that you have how those are used in front of question or more? No, I knew they are. And they actually uh, leveraged the concept of the gas generators uh, that Lowe did. Uh, there are, you know, there are several, yeah, so many improvements occurred in the balloon core based on, uh, of, 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 of other nations based on what we did in the Okay. I was Thank just you. wondering if there was any books you would recommend. Okay. So there's a, a book that was published a couple uh, years ago by Evans called uh, uh, The War of the Aeronauts. Don't buy that. I can't read a page of it without finding a problem. The best book. But it only covers part of the balloon core, is by Hayden, and it's called The Aeronautics of the Union and Confederate Armies. And uh, it uh, came out uh, in, in the 40s, but reissued uh, by, uh, I think, John Hopkins Press. And Tom Crouch wrote a really beautiful in intro to the book, but it's, a, it's really an outstanding book. And then mine will come out in about two years. <laughs> Thank you very much. Perfect. I love it. I do. I do. I love it. So, so on the way home, yeah. If you want a nice sweet treat, to the turkey bar. Perfect. And there's your compensation. No, 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 you can't do that. No, no. No, you can't do that. He's got well, that's what I told Kevin. Well, I'll give it to Kevin. No, no, you give it to Bud. <laughs> Got your name on it. <laughs> Anyhow. Well, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.